Let's get started. We're going to be talking about magnetic things today. It's kind of fun, I hope. Hope we get there. Um, actually, skip that. <laughs> skip that because we haven't talked about it carefully enough. We ended last class period by first introducing the electric motor, but not getting to that question. So the electric motor is the device we use with that current loop. Do you guys remember, I know, Wednesday of last week, a long time ago. You remember where we ended the class period where we had current going around the loop and I had the different students, well, first we had the clicker question about the net force and then had the different students calculate the torque on each piece of that loop. And we ended the class period saying that the torque was equal to the current times the magnetic field times, and we had AB, which was the area, and so I said that's equal to IB times the area. Does everybody remember that? Okay, so that's the key to the way an electric motor works. An electric motor works because when you pass current through a loop in a magnetic field, you're going to have a torque created on that loop. But that torque is going to make it so it rotates until the elect or the magnetic fields. How, how should the magnetic field be in its lowest energy configuration? The very beginning, I talked about what happens when I put a compass in a magnetic field. What happens to that compass? Okay, it aligns so it's parallel to the magnetic field. So the magnetic field comes out of the north and goes into the south. And so with that loop, it's going to align so that you have, in essence, a magnetic field created by that loop. See the picture behind me? It shows an S and an N on these coils. The reason is when I have current going through that wire, it creates a magnetic field in the wire, in the core of the wire. And so it behaves like there's a north and south pole and it's gonna align so this north and south pole of what we'll call an electromagnet for now is aligned with the external magnetic field. If we were to look at the simplified picture and not talk about fields, the simplified picture we had before was just a, a loop like this. If we had a force that pulls this side up and pushes that side down, it's just going to go like this, right? Now, momentum, angular momentum, is going to make it so it goes past and comes back and it goes in friction and make it finally stop there. So it doesn't continue to rotate. That's not a very useful electric motor if it doesn't rotate, right? It just does at most a half turn and, and then wiggles around a while and stops. So to make an electric motor, if we're just going to use a DC direct current like a battery, we're going to have to do something tricky. And that tricky thing is what's called a split armature. So we have brushes. These two pieces of metal are called brushes because they're brushing on a rotating rod. And that rotating rod has connections. So here you see a connection right there that then goes to wires on my loop. But as it rotates, the brush will break connection with one of those pads and make a connection with a different one. And so what we can do with that is we can make so the current changes direction. Every half turn, we reverse the direction of the current in the loop. But if you reverse the direction of the current in the loop, what are you doing to the force? You're also reversing it. And so you had forces that were creating a torque to make it do a half turn. When it gets to the point where it's going to stop making it rotate is where you have your brushes switch over. So now it creates a torque to make it do another half turn. So we call that a split, a split armature. And by so doing, it makes it so it has a torque in the same direction every half turn. The current switches direction every half turn to keep the torque in the same direction. So that's how we can make a DC motor. So you just connect the battery and it spins up. And so if you're like me, I think I mentioned to a couple of students, you know, as a kid, I got a, a little um, electric toy race car set. 
you, know, you got the little track and the cars go around the track and you have a little trigger you can pull it harder or, you know maybe go faster what you're doing is you're just putting a voltage difference on two metal rails and the, the, that voltage difference is of course you have brushes on the the cars to rub that just like in the old days, you had electric cable cars that would do something like that, but up above. They might still have them in San Francisco. I had to check recently. Um, and then that's going to an electric motor, but it's direct current, it's constant voltage. And so to make it go faster, you use more voltage. More voltage means you're going to have more current if it's the same resistor. But if you have more current through that resistor, that means a bigger torque your electric motor because it's IBA. But it, if it only went half turn stop, it wouldn't be good to have a split armature. One more thing, if you look at this picture, that's not a single loop of wire. That's multiple loops of wire. Why multiple loops? Each loop is going to create a torque of IBA. If I have two loops, what's that going to do the torque? Double it. If I have 50 loops, what does it do the torque? 50 times bigger. So we throw an N out here where N is the number of loops. Now I have to add one more thing. This was the maximum torque. I said when we get to the alignment like this, the torque is going to go to zero. So the actual torque as a function of angle is equal to N, I put it in this order so I remember, NBA, I, or I suppose if you want to be egocentric here, you can put the I out front, I, NBA, I am the NBA. And then we have sine of the angle between the <clears throat> magnetic field that's external and the area of our loop. Remember the area, what direction do we apply to the area? Normal to it. So if the area is like my fingers here, then the area is coming out like that. And so that's our full-on equation for the torque, I N B A sine of the angle between the magnetic field and the torque. Now we can go back and answer this question. Yes, you can answer now. Aaron is the only one who has, just in case you're wondering. Okay, two, one, 15, zero. Okay, so we have a strong agreement by use of a split armature with brushes to reverse the current. Jerry, did you answer that? And give us your reason why that's gonna work. When the, when the brushes switch sides, it allows the motor to keep spinning. Why? I know it says it reverses the current, but why is reversing the current? Right now, avoid that. It's possible. Why is reversing the current make it so it can continue to rotate? Um, okay, it flips the magnetic field, which then reverses the direction of the torque. The torque was from pointing, let's say, this way. And then it comes to zero, and then it would have gone this way, but reversing it makes it go that way again, so the torque's the same direction. So it makes it so every half turn it flips the direction of the current, hence the torque ends up going the same direction. Okay. Other things that we can do with this. A galvanometer. You guys read about galvanometers in your textbook? Yes? I know some people have. The galvanometer is a device that will tell you how much current is flowing. You basically put a spring, and then you put 
current through this loop, the current you're trying to measure, and the amount it rotates will be the amount to where the spring force is equal to the torque force. And so it can be calibrated to tell you what the current is as a function of the angle. So it's just a nice little example of how to use this. That's all. Now for something completely initially confusing, but very useful. Ampere's law. Now, if we were French, we would say this differently, you know, ampere, something like that. But being an American, this is a word I'm just going to mispronounce and go with it. Ampere. Ampere's law is very similar in nature to Gauss's law. So let's review Gauss's law for electricity. Gauss's law for electricity, what did it relate for us? Okay, the electric flux, which was how much electric field was coming out of the surface, and what else? The charge and close. So it allowed us to, since the electric flux is electric field coming out of the surface, it allowed us to, knowing the charge, calculate the electric field, or knowing the electric field, calculate the charge. There is a Gauss's law for magnetism, like I already said. The problem is, magnets always come in dipoles. You never have a monopole. You never have just a north. You never have just a south. You always have equal north and south. So any, any surface you make is going to always have a net charge enclosed of zero for magnetic charge. And if you have a net magnetic charge of zero enclosed, what should the flux be, the magnetic flux? Zero. So Gauss's law applies to magnetism. It's just not very useful to a class at this level. Now, for people in the calculus base class, Gauss's law for magnetism is one of our four Maxwell's equations that we're going to look at. But that's looking at it in a little different context. So Ampere's law is something that has to do with the magnetic field, but not the magnetic flux. Instead, we have what we call the circulation. And the circulation is making a loop. Instead of a closed surface, a three-dimensional surface, we're making a loop. And the circulation is Okay, there's the calculus form. Now I'm going to ask the calculus students to describe what this means so we can get it into a non-calculus form. So Jonathan, you're the closest. What does it mean to have this funny S with a circle on it? Um, that's basically, if you're doing a non-calculus, you would write it as a sigma, a capital sigma. You're, you're summing, and then the little circle means that you're summing it about like an enclosed surface, right? Um, because this is a DL, it's an enclosed loop. Okay. If it was DA, it'd be enclosed surface. Right. So it's so there, it's assuming there's no breaks in the loop. Right. There's no breaks. It's got to be a completed. Um, doesn't have to be a circle, but it has to be a completed loop. So you start where you end with no breaks. So you're adding them up. What does people without calculus? So I'll go to Brandy. What does it mean to have this dot between the two? The what? Perpendicular. Um, parallel. parallel. Remember, the cross looks like perpendicular, and that's perpendicular. So that's multiplying the parallel parts times, and DL just means a small piece of length, so I just put L there. So that's our, our non-calculus version. It takes a little more understanding. The calculus version tells you exactly what it is. The non-calculus version, you have to have a little interpretation to understand what it means. But that circulation is you make up some arbitrary loop. So that's up to you. It's your decision. And along that arbitrary loop, you're going to add the magnetic field parallel to each segment of the wire, or of your loop, not the wire, of your loop. And that's the circulation. And according to Ampere's law, this is equal to the current that is enclosed by that loop times a constant. That constant I put mu, that's the Greek letter M, with the subscript of zero. It's called the permeability of free space. Remember, epsilon zero was the um, 
permittivity of free space. That was telling us how easy it was to um, pass charge through free space. This permeability of free space is telling us how easy it is to magnetize free space. And so we can change, we saw with capacitors, we could put different dielectrics in, they had different electric permittivities and that changed the capacitance values. Same thing here, if we use something instead of air, like we put iron, we use mu, the perme permeability of iron, and the permeability of iron is like a thousand times bigger than the permeability of air or vacuum. And so that's going to result in the side with the magnetic field being about a thousand times bigger, making a really much stronger magnetic field. So this is Ampere's law. And as the people in the calculus class can tell you, when we applied Gauss's law, what was the first thing we looked at? Symmetry. And it's going to be the same thing here. We're going to want to have a symmetry that makes it easy for us to calculate that circulation. If we don't have a symmetry that's easy to cal calculate the circulation, well, then we have to go to this thing called the Biot-Savart law, which is spelled Biot-Savart. Yeah, really kills me with these French names. I don't have that ability. So let's look at how this thing works. Here we see Ampere's law. So that's exactly what I wrote out, except for it put a delta L to remind us there's the different pieces. Comparison between Ampere's law and Gauss's law. Let's just do an example. I don't think I have an example. Oh, I do. Okay. Here's an example of how to use Ampere's law. So we have a wire. We're going to make it an infinitely long wire. What's in calculus, students? Aaron? Why do we choose an infinitely long wire? So that you have infinite magnetic fields above and below. Or okay, it's going to require a symmetry that says, okay, magnetic field lines have to do loops, right? They can't start and stop. They always are continuous, going in the south and out of the north. So if I have an infinite wire, my symmetry commands the only shape of loop that fits with the symmetry of an infinite wire is a circle, right? We can have radial, but that would not be a, a loop. So it has to be circles for the magnetic field if we have an infinite wire. If it's not infinite, the, the symmetry gets broken. In practice, if our distance away from the wire is small compared to the distance to the ends of the wire, we can treat it like it's infinite in length because the symmetry is not broken in a region where you're far from the ends. So we have an infinite wire, which requires that the magnetic fields are doing circles around it just because of the symmetry. Don't have to go through any fancy descriptions. Any other shape, if you change your angle, it would be different. It's the only one where you go around a circle and it's the same. Go up and down, it's the same. So in that case, the circulation is kind of easy. Because if the magnetic field is doing a circle, I can make a shape that's going to be a circle with the constant radius from the wire, and that will ensure that at every place on that circle, the magnetic field is either parallel or anti-parallel, that is the same direction or opposite direction, as my circle. So that means the parallel parts, B dot DL, is either plus B times the circumference or minus B times the circumference. And so I'm just gonna put the magnitude for now. So my circulation is gonna have to be B times the circumference, circumference of a circle is 2 pi r, is equal to mu watt times the current enclosed. Well, I just look at my circle and I say, how much current is passing inside of that circle? I have one wire carrying current I, so how much current passed through? I. Right, if there have been two wires with current I, it would have been two I, right? So it's just going to be real easy. B times 2 pi r is equal to mu watt times the current. So B is equal to mu watt i over 2 pi r. So I'm able to find the magnetic field due to that wire at some distance r away really simply. 
But we have the direction because magnetic field is a vector. And for the direction, we use yet another right-hand rule. At some point, you have too many right-hand rules. So far, the right-hand rule that we have is a cross-product right-hand rule. I think that's the only one we've done, right? Yeah. So here's right-hand rule number two. That's why it says RHR-2. It's a different rule. But we still, we like to use our right hand to define things in science. So you take your right hand and put your fingers so they wrap around it the direction of the magnetic field and your thumb points the direction of the current. Or in this case, because I was given the current, if the current's going up, I put my thumb on my right hand vertical and then I wrap my fingers around in a circle. And wherever my fingertips are, the magnetic field is pointing the direction my fingertips are pointing. So if I want to know the magnetic field where Isaac is, I would just have to rotate my hand out here so my fingertips are where Isaac is and what direction my fingertips are pointing. Real question. Somebody point with your fin hand, per se. That way, and so that's how I get the direction. Whereas what direction is the magnetic field where I am from this same current? It's going to be that direction. And so we use the right hand rule to get the direction, but this is a new right hand rule. Yes, Jordan. So if you're pointing it towards you, it's where you're <coughs> Okay, so where I am, I have to bring my fingers out so they're on the side of the wire that's between the wire and me. And then my fingertips are pointing that way. So that's how we get the directions with the right hand rule. We got the magnitude there using <coughs> Ampere's law. That wasn't a hard application of Ampere's law at all. We'll see a few more interesting applications coming up in just a few moments. Any questions about Ampere's law before we go on to those just a few moments? Jonathan. Wait, so on the second right hand rule, so if the current was running the opposite way, then it would still be pointing in the same direction, right? No, if the current's going down, then I put my thumb down, and so <laughs> bringing my hand so my fingers are between me, it's pointing the opposite direction. Okay. So once again on the next test, there might be a time when you're sitting here trying to figure out what direction with your right hand. And notice that's number two. It's not the final one. So here, practical application. A wire is carrying current to the right on the screen. So here's the current. Was the direction of the magnetic field produced by the current at a point directly below the wire? So what direction is the magnetic field at point P there? And this will be answered by the last person who hasn't answered a clicker question yet. <laughs> and yes, Aaron probably knows that's her. Okay, waiting on Mahala and Sandy. Sandy answered twice just for good measure. Boom, boom. There we go. I can't see what your answer is, but it changes color when you answer multiple times. It's just in case people are like, you know, is he monitoring? Does he know? Okay. So we had a preponderance of the students, a supermajority, who answered into the screen. So Aaron, guide me the unsuspecting teacher, and how you came up with your answer. It's kind of impossible to put your hand like that. So I just pointed it to the left and said it was out of the screen if the current's going left, so just switch it and it'll be off. Okay. She, she went being a little more tricky because she has that ability. She said, well, if I reverse it and then I reverse it again, that will bring it back to correct. So you should put your thumb pointing to the right and then your fingers at the bottom so, yeah, are pointing in and it's in. And what she did is perfectly valid, right? I would never mark you off for that because it's perfectly valid. But I just want to make sure everybody understands the fundamental of the rule. Okay. 
Any questions about that? Because I think I have another question on direction coming up. Okay. Um, yeah, I stopped again. A single loop of wire, that doesn't have a nice symmetry for using Ampere's law. Now in the calculus class, we have a way of doing this, right? We can do it with the Biosava law, or we could do an integral that's kind of annoying and difficult, but it's an infinite integral changing once again to theta, and we can do it. So this is something that they will be doing in class manana. But for the rest of you, we're just going to take it on faith that for a circle, the magnetic field at the center of the circle is mu -ot, since this is one loop, n is one, so it would be mu -ot times the current divided by two times the radius. So that's where you get the center of a single loop. If you have multiple loops, that's why you have the n in the, cir in the equation I circle. Because multiple loops, you just have n times that magnetic field to add together their vectors. That's the magnetic field at the center of the loop. What's going to happen to the magnetic field strength if I move out to here? Stronger, weaker, or the same? It decreases a little. How do you know? The lines got farther apart. That's right. We can read from the lines. We know it got weaker. And, of course, the direction changes depending on location. It's obviously much weaker out here than it is in the center. And so we have to pay attention to where that number is. This is what we call a solenoid. This here is an example of a solenoid. Not this piece, but what remains. So what it is is a bunch of wires wrapped in a circle. Just so you know, yeah, this is dangerous. I'm going to plug this into the wall in a few moments. And this right here is the two electrical contacts. <laughs> There's the two electrical contacts right there. Um, <clears throat> that's just a wire wrapped in a circle. Tell me about the resistance of that wire. Pretty, well, we like to use, you know, darn here, but I, I'm actually really embarrassed. You guys been paying attention to the Oroville Dam situation? I keep spelling it D-A-M-N when I make posts on Facebook. <laughs> I know better, but I don't use the word often enough, and it just flows off my fingertips. <laughs> so, yeah. Seth sent me an email. I told him, hey, you got to pay attention to that Oroville Dam for your civil engineering students. And he wrote back, um, you should probably pay attention to autocorrect. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to admit it wasn't autocorrect. I should just learn to spell. Anyway, that's way off topic. So it's pretty low. Pretty low because it's just a wire. So when I use this thing, I'm just going to plug it in and pull it out real quick. And I'm not going to do it right now. It's part of a demonstration that's actually, I think, totally cool. But this is a solenoid. It's wires wrapped in a circle. And when I wrap the wires in a circle, it's going to make a magnetic field due to all those wires going around a circle, right? How big of a magnetic field? Those wires aren't on top of each other. They're spread out. So it's not the same as this equation here because they're spread out. So we have to figure out, and we can do this, using Ampere's law. Oh, I made a mistake right there because I have a clicker question coming up that deals with that. But <clears throat> a solenoid, you see a pretty picture of a solenoid here. How is that different from mine? Well, that's only a single loop or a single thickness of loop. This one here, it's pretty thick. There's multiple windings going back and forth. So I have more windings per unit area. This is something like you might be making for your inductively charging experiment. <clears throat> Anyone here ever had an MRI? All right. We got multiple people. Usually I'm the only one. People are like, huh, you got an MRI? Sure. Had one on my knee when I hurt that. Had, you know, 
Anyway, MRIs use really strong magnetic fields. And how they make those magnetic fields, they use a coil, a solenoid. And actually, I think they often use it in the Helmholtz coil arrangement. A Helmholtz coil, <laughs> where is the Helmholtz coil? I had a picture of it, I swear I did. Oh, yeah, it's right here. <laughs> this is called a Helmholtz coil. Notice the geometry there. You have two loops of radius R. They're separated by a rate by a separation R. With this geometry, it turns out when you do the math, oh, great, there it is. When you do the math, you have a very uniform magnetic field through the center. And by center, I mean now anything that's inside of the coil. And so it's a way of making a uniform magnetic field, but not having as much wire in there. And so I'm pretty sure that's actually what they're doing in an MRI. It would depend on the MRI. So in the MRI, they're getting very strong magnetic fields. You guys aren't old enough to remember when this first became something they put in the hospital. They had the NMR. What does NMR stand for? Nuclear Magnetic Resonance. And so you had it, you went to the hospital and you'd have an NMR and people got really scared because it's nuclear and that's dangerous, right? And of course, all you're talking about is you're looking at the direction of the magnetic dipoles of the nuclei in your body. You have nuclei in your body, we all agree, right? And you're just looking at the magnetic properties of those nuclei. There's no radiation concern here, but people saw the word nuclear and they got scared. And so they just dropped the N off and they just call it magnetic resonance imaging, so about three letters MRI, and drop off the N. And so if in organic lab you did an NMR, like NMR spectroscopy, that's essentially what they're doing here, except for they're tuning to look for just a single transition. I think it's hydrogen they're looking at because you've got a lot of water in your body. Um, but they're just tuning to look for a single transition. Okay, next clicker question. Do you see an exploitable symmetry to apply Ampere's law on an infinite solenoid? Notice my picture is not infinite. My picture is finite. All right. Now, even though you missed a question, you're good, Katie. Question? Hmm? Yes. <coughs> when you were out of the room, we oh, had a clicker okay. question. But you only have to answer 60% and you're 66% now. 66.6. .6. Okay. Looking at the answers here, 14, 4, 0, and 1. So 14 people said, yes, they see a cylindrical symmetry. And four people said yes, they see a planar symmetry. And zero people said yes, something else. And one person said, no, I don't see Jack. Well, the symmetry that's exploitable here, it turns out, is not a cylindrical symmetry. The symmetry that we have that's exploitable is something else. <laughs> Question, Jonathan? Is it linear? I, I don't know a name for it. But what we can do is we can say, okay, if this is infinite in length, then what direction is the magnet field going to be outside of the solenoid? What direction is it going to have to be if it's making loops? It's going to have to be straight horizontal. Right, straight vertical wouldn't work because that would be radial and you don't have a loop. So it's going to have to be straight horizontal. So we have to have our magnetic fields outside are doing straight lines like this. Now the symmetry we're going to use here is I'm going to make a loop that goes like 
Hmm. What can you tell me about the circulation on the left and right sides of that loop? Remember, the circulation is magnetic field dotted to the length of that wire. Length is like this, magnetic field is like that. It's zero because they're perpendicular and we're only doing the parallel parts. So my circulation on the sides <clears throat> So I'm going to have B side dot delta L side plus B top dot delta L top plus B bottom dot delta L bottom. If we look at these pieces on the side, this goes to zero because perpendicular. What about on the top? What's the circulation going to be on the top of that thing? It turns out the answer is zero, but you have to put in some qualifiers before it makes sense. The way I've drawn it, it would not be zero because the magnetic field is parallel to the wire. And so it's going to be whatever the strength of the magnetic field there is multiplied by the length of that wire. But since the circulation on the sides is zero, no matter what length it is, we make this rectile, rectile, <laughs> rectangle. So it has an infinite height. What's the magnetic field going to be infinitely far away from this coil? Zero, because it's dropping off with distance. You can tell by the picture it's dropping off with distance. So if you go infinitely far away, it has to be zero. And so that is going to be zero because, because B top is equal to zero at L side approaching infinity. And then we're left with just the one piece, the piece that's in the center. And so we're going to have B in the center, because that's where the bottom was, was in the center, times the length of my wire. Let's give it a name. Let's give it a lowercase b. That's my total circulation. And that's going to be equal to permeability of free space multiplied by the current enclosed. What's the current enclosed going to be? If I have current I going through that wire, how do I find the current enclosed? Yeah, it, it's, it's a little complicated, right? Because there's more than one wire that's going through my loop. And so I need to know how many it is. So I could write it you know, something like, well, N times the current, but I don't know what N is. And so to get N, we say, let's define lowercase N is equal to N total divided by the length of my cylinder, or my cylinder, of my solenoid. The solenoid is infinite in length for my calculation, but in reality, it's never going to be infinite in length. So that n is the number of loops per unit length. And so if I have n loops per unit length, then the number of loops enclosed is equal to the number of loops per unit length multiplied by that length. And so I have i enclosed is equal to number of loops loops per unit length, multiplied by the width of my loop, and then multiplied by the current in the wire. Put that in here. Notice I have that B on both sides. Really important. If it, was diff if it didn't cancel out, then I'd have a situation where it depended on 
what shape I chose with the magnet field was at the center, and that's not tenable. So we have the magnet field in the center of the solenoid is equal to mu at the number of loops per unit length multiplied by the current. So that's how we get the magnet field inside of a solenoid. Like I said, it's a little bit more complicated, but it was still using Ampere's law. Just we didn't have a simple symmetry there, right? It was something that was something else. Before I get to that, I'm going to end with that. Let's do this one problem. Finding the force on this loop of wire. So I have a current that's going from left to right of 15 amps. It's a big amount of current. And then I have a loop carrying 30 amps. That's even a bigger amount, obviously. And I want to know about the force between that loop and the wire. Give me a strategy. Um, let's go to Brady because he's all comfortable. Give me a strategy. Bad idea. Bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess you find, so you do like individual forces, like base one from the loop, one from the wire. Okay, you're kind of on the right track. The first thing is that wire is, as far as we know, an infinitely long wire. If it's an infinitely long wire, we can find the magnetic field due to it. And then if we know the magnetic field, we can find the force on any piece of wire that's in its magnetic field. So our strategy is first find the magnetic field due to the wire, and then use that to find the force on each piece of wire. So. What's the equation for the magnetic field due to that wire? <clears throat> Mu hot I over 2 pi R. That was the first application we did of Ampere's law. So the top wire here is 7.5 centimeters is R. The bottom wire is 7.5 plus 10, so 17.5 for R. And then the sides are going from 7.5 to 17.5. But it's not just the magnitude of the magnetic field. What's the equation for the force? Force on a wire carrying current due to a magnetic field. QVB was for a charge. That's a correct equation, but that's for a charge moving. We wanted the one for on a wire, which is derived from that equation. IL cross B. Right? You got to remember it has the cross product in there. So let's look at this piece by piece. We, we can see what the magnetic field is from the equation there. What direction is the magnetic field going to be pointing in the regions we're interested in? Okay, I see a number of people using their right hands correctly. It's going to be pointing in because you're underneath. So the magnetic field is going to be pointing <coughs> just writing these around so we don't get confused. Then we use L cross B on each side. So on the top piece, my current is going to your left. So using the cross product of I L cross B, what direction do I need to have my fingers pointing? Um, James. What, which, let, let's just start with L. Which finger should be pointing in the direction of L? Which one? Okay, the index. Okay, the index finger should be pointing in the direction of L because it's the first one 
And so I'm going to have the direction of L is the direction the current's going. So I'm going to take my right hand and make sure I have my index finger pointing that direction. Then I need to orient my hand so my finger points, my middle finger points the direction of the magnetic field. What direction is the magnetic field there? In. And so my thumb points down. There we go. So we have the force on the top is going that way. So, Gabriel, the easiest one of all, given that information, what direction is the force on the bottom? Okay, that was easy because it was just reversing the direction. Okay, so Nate, what about the force on, let's choose this side here because it's closer to me. So current is going up there. What direction is the force there? Yes. <laughs> and Carrie, what direction is the force on the other side? Okay, so there we have the directions. Now, if I wanted to find the force left or force right as I've labeled them, it requires calculus. All the calculus students could do this easily enough. But everyone in here can do it. Because if you look at force left and force right, what can you tell me? They're going to cancel each other out. Not, they're going to add out to zero, right? They're going to add out to zero because you have the same magnetic field at the same height and the same current, but opposite directions. So I can use a symmetry argument to say that force left plus force right. Got to make sure you put the vector signs or it isn't correct. And thus I'm left with an easy calculation. The force top is equal to my length of 30.0 centimeters times my magnetic field strength of 15 times 15 amps divided by 2 pi times 7.50 centimeters times the current. So I have all of the numbers there and I just have to multiply through. And likewise, I could calculate the magnitude of the force in the bottom. Whoops, I used 30 amps twice. Should have been 15 one of them. No, I was right the first time. Wait, undo. Undo to the rescue. So there's the magnitudes of the two forces. You multiply them out. The force bottom we had going up, the force top going down. Boom, you have your answer. One thing I haven't given you a number for, I swear I had it right there. I, I must have skipped it, or maybe I actually deleted the slide, is the value of mu ot. I believe it's 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7, and I honestly don't remember the units at all. But that's, it is a constant. It's a given, so you can work with it. Now, this here, to show you the fun, I have a ring of aluminum. I'm going to put this ring of aluminum on top of it and see what happens when I plug this into the wall. What happened? Somebody want to say? It did something, right? It rattled a little. I'm going to put this iron in. 
The iron has a magnetic permeability that's about a thousand times bigger. What's that going to do the magnetic field strength? Increase it by about a thousand times. Now let's see if anything happens. So next class period, we'll start by trying to understand what happened there.